what's brave about it when by far most people believe this, by far most people say this, this is just everybody else's opinions repeated over and over. Doing this instead says, now everything from here forward, just go ahead and believe that I don't understand what it is that I'm talking about. Yes. I think no, that no, I Simone saw, I saw a little are... bit, I, I saw a little bit of what you were saying when she had social constructionism on the screen and she was saying the the Bo Burnham line, artist line, nothing is real, and I was impressed by that. You actually were, you were correct. It kind of discounts all of the gendered characteristics that are forced on men as well, and otherizing them from women just the same as women are being otherized from men. I guess what frustrates me about that argument is why why am I always getting quizzed? This is so stupid. I hate you. <laughs> if we don't have words to describe these things, they just don't exist to us. It sounds like she was understood as a man. It sounds like she lived her life as a man. That didn't mean that she stopped being a female. So let's talk about self-ID. What is self-ID? I think it's a great video. I agree with all of this. The accounts of rape, wife beating, forced childbearing, medical butchering, sex motivated murder, forced prostitution, physical mutilation, sadistic psychological abuse, and other common places of female experience that are excavated from the past or given by contemporary survivors should leave the heart seared. The mind in anguish, the conscience in upheaval. They do not. No matter how often these stories are told with Whatever clarity or eloquence, bitterness or sorrow, they might as well have been whispered in the wind or written in sand. They disappear as if they were nothing. The tellers and the stories are ignored or ridiculed, threatened back into silence or destroyed, and the experience of female suffering is buried in cultural invisibility and contempt. It's kind of, it's kind of annoying how feminists take this and they're like, look, Look how everybody ignores our problems. Look how nobody takes us seriously. Even when we're talking about rape and sexual assault and all of these other things. That's no different than literally everybody else's problems everywhere in the world. There's children starving in Africa. You don't care. I don't care. We're not going to pretend like we care. Really, if anything, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get to work but they refuse to do it because they're freaking lazy, okay? We all know it. And you don't you don't care, Chase. First they probably need to get bootstraps. They need to get boots, then maybe some bootstraps and then pull themselves up by them so that they can really make some real money like Andrew Tate. This is how everybody thinks. This is how we always deal with other people's problems because other people's problems are so far away that there's no reason for it to feel like it affects us. This is all problems, all issues, all, all uh, oppressions. Everybody else's crap is everybody else's crap. It's not our crap. It's not mine. It's not yours. We don't really care. We talk as though we care. We we look as though we care. Oh my goodness, that really, that happened. But we don't really care. We don't care. This isn't special. This isn't different. Women's issues aren't any different than anybody else's issues. It is what it is. The very reality of abuse sustained by women, despite its overwhelming pervasiveness and constancy, is negated. It is negated in the transactions of everyday life, it is negated in the history books left out, and it is negated by those who claim to care about suffering but are blind to suffering. Is any of this stuff copyrighted? I'm not watching this if this crap's copyrighted. Whoa. Listing off a bunch of books she hasn't read, eh? Listing off a bunch of books she read the Wikipedia of.
In Latin America, rape and domestic violence are widespread. From Argentina to Colombia to Central America, women marked Women's Day to say enough. Mothers. Yeah, let's go back to watching Palm Bean. That's enough of that. Damn it. And daughters march together. <laughs> ah, we got it. We, she popped up quick. She popped up quick. Can't. Can't pretend you're not sitting here watching. <laughs> I belong to a generation of women educated to be servants of men, and I see my young female students suffering sexual abuse from as early as kindergarten. This. But we'll have. Did you see Palmby? Did you see him Paul B though, Lav? How long you been here for? You've been here more than like four minutes. Did you see her? Has to end. Las Tesis Senior. Their choreographed chant, a rapist in your path, has become a feminist mantra. Women of all ages, occupations, and economic standing filled Santiago's largest avenue, vowing to fight gender inequality, stereotypes, and much more. Later, Benjamin. Women in Iran set their headscarves on fire in fury. Their protest is sparked by the death of this woman. Her name is Mahsa Amini, and she was just 22. She was arrested by the morality police in Tehran. They said she wasn't wearing the mandatory hijab or headscarf properly. The security forces have released the CTV footage of Mahsa in detention. It's heavily edited. Women cry death to the dictator and wave their headscarves at her funeral. The inscription on her gravestone reads that she's not dead. Her name will become a symbol and live forever. As Mahsa's family predicted, her name has already become a symbol. A symbol of resistance. The problem, simply stated, is that one must believe in the existence of the person in order to recognize the authenticity of her suffering. Neither men nor women believe in the existence of women as significant beings. Wait. Hold on. I... I read your whole essay, your bad essay. You're talking about my document. I, I need to rewrite some of it, but it's not bad. You agreed with it. I, I can pull up the clip if you would like. You you agreed uh, with my document. Uh, you conceded. Beings. <laughs> It is impossible to remember as real the suffering of someone who, by definition, has no legitimate claim to dignity or freedom. Someone who is in fact viewed as some thing, an object or an absence. And if a woman, an individual woman multiplied by billions, does not believe in her own discrete existence and therefore cannot credit the authenticity of her own suffering, she is erased, cancelled out, and the meaning of her life, whatever it is, whatever it might have been, is lost. This loss cannot be calculated or comprehended. It is vast and awful, and nothing will ever make up for it. Andrea Dworkin, right-wing women. My name is Leah Little. You might have seen me as Beret Girl recently on the Whatever podcast. You might know me from Twitch politics. You might know me from having an OnlyFans for many years and then becoming very staunchly anti-sex work, anti-sex industry. You might have known me from my funny tweets. You might have known me from my funny TikToks. I have been in the recesses of the internet for a very long time, like a cockroach. You can't kill me. I've been canceled a multitude of times and I won't stay dead. And love it or hate it, here I am. But something that has been very pervasive in the past couple years and something that has motivated my personal journey into, call it whatever you want, being sympathetic to radical feminism, being a radical feminist, or being a materialist feminist, one thing that made me question everything as a liberal, as a leftist, as a Democrat, is the gender thing. I... Wait, Femoid, everybody keeps telling me I'm next. What the hell? 
with immediacy as soon as I was brought into the whole fold of the gender idea. I could not stop watching whatever I could about it. I've been obsessed with this gender, this transgender idea for a very long time. I think this stems from being a gender non-conforming queer person growing up, identifying as a lesbian and then identifying as bisexual. Yeah, I'm one of those. Gender imagery has baffled me. I've always thought that the politics surrounding gender identity were insane, incoherent, and I just never understood it. But I think there's a big problem with most of the anti-gender or gender atheism legislation or ideology. There's a big problem in our movement, and the problem is that it is ran by Judeo-Christian males who don't care about women when they speak of gender. They're just homophobic. They're homophobic. They see trans women as gay men, and the stem of that, the root cause, is homophobia. That's why they don't like these people, because they're disgusted by it. I think that's a big problem. The Steven Crowders, the Ben Shapiros, the Matt Walshes of the world don't care about women. There's no real leftist or liberal representation of being anti-gender or gender atheism on the left. And I hope to be that. Call it whatever you want, wishful thinking. Maybe I'm a narcissistic martyr. Call it whatever you want. I think that women's voices need to be heard and I'd like mine to be heard. So I put together this essay to hopefully change the tides a little bit. I'm trying to show that not everyone who is anti-gender, identity, ideology, craziness, is this conservative piece of shit man who just is homophobic. I want to give a new face to this movement, a younger face, an intellectual face, and an empathetic face. So without further ado, this is my essay. The nature of gender, the concept of gender identity, and the social and political implications of genderism. What is a woman? Screw you, Matt Walsh. So I'm awaiting my impending 30th cancellation. This topic might be the one that does me in. I can't imagine a debate I've been privy to that has been more hostile. A lot of people in this debate have silenced others, mostly women, by discrediting them as inherently bigoted, oppressive, and the perpetrator slash contributor. Oh, before I go Tom Fulry's show, what broadcast software do you use? Uh, OBS. This is my setup. Honestly, one out of three ain't bad. Good meme. Damn. I watched back a stream the other day, and you asked a question, and it was a good question, and I missed it while I was live. And I saw it back, and I wanted to answer it, and now I can't remember what it was. Crap. Tom, my name is Good Meme in a YouTube chat. My memory isn't that good. <laughs> Fair enough. Contributor <laughs> to trans genocide. So any and all dissent of this gender movement is seen as oppressive or even violent. So if you don't want to contribute to suffering, pain, and further marginalization of trans people, you have to accept the doctrine, the gender doctrine in its entirety. So while- that's obviously not true, because I obviously do not accept the gender doctrine in its entirety. Um, I think most people who would say trans women are women do not accept it in its entirety. The She's talking about like trans activists, and I think most people agree trans activists are just the freaking worst. They, she's right. They are so extreme. They take all t sorts of oppression to the most extreme um, like they'll say like, you know, oh, if you call somebody by the wrong pronouns, they're going to commit suicide or you, you have like, uh, um, you know, like one gender or one bathroom bill gets through and they're, oh, you're, they're, you're genociding us. Like, it's just the most extreme stuff all of the freaking time. And it's not, it's not real. It's not, uh. It's not serious. They no like they've done a lot. They've gotten a lot done. Being extreme has really helped them. Online trans activists, sure, but I don't think there's an I don't think there's much of a distinction. 
Kuro. I, I don't think there's much of a distinction between online trans activists and trans activists these days. Uh, trans activists are online now. Like, they are, they are trans activism now. And it's sad, but that is the case. Even when you go watch people who are talking in front of Congress, they are saying all the same things as the online trans activists. So it's, it is what it is. While I go over these points today, I've been told in itself. But yeah, I like, that is not trans activism. That is not, it's like people saying like black activists, and then they start bringing up uh, critical race theory and abolishing the police and crap like that like it's just that's not the real that's not most most people can still be in favor of you know black equality and helping black people in some ways and not be on board with all of that other bull crap it's the same with you know trans ideology it's uh i it, there's the extremists and then there's the the rest of us even holding up this topic for scrutiny will cause damage and will have been me inciting violence against a stigmatized and marginalized group. I refuse to accept this premise. Quote, if you don't respect my gender identity, you don't respect me. This is a piece of dogma constantly peddled in this movement. We are required to believe the stories that people tell us about their identity. The sad part is that- Do you remember what stream it was mate, might spark my memory? I don't see you very often, so... I don't remember, but I want to say it was the last time I had Lav on, because I think generally that's when you pop up. A lot of these people have been successful in selling this, and yet most people I've spoken to about gender agree with a lot of the things I'm going to say here, on most things I've said, but they tell me they are scared to speak about it publicly. This minority has somehow infiltrated the zeitgeist what was it like dealing with the uh, racial tensions and self-segregation in prison? Um, it's not that bad in Georgia because uh, there's in Georgia, I think black people are only like 13 percent of the population, which means that they're about 70 percent of the prison population. So a lot less than most other prisons. Um, but the. The it like for the most part, there wasn't a whole lot of uh segregation as far as like gangs and stuff in georgia it was uh more like um like everybody segregated based on like clicks and crap like that which was still divided by race but there wasn't a whole lot of fights back and forth like there was one or two times that i got into it with the black guys but other black guys had my back each time and so, um, yeah, it's just, it's not as segregated as other prisons are generally. Um, Georgia, Georgia prisons aren't all that bad. And made it impossible to scrutinize something that is very easily scrutinizable. Well, I'm obviously not scared to speak about it. And I don't accept the dogma. I don't believe I'm being inherently bigoted by scrutinizing genderism, and I do not believe that to respect you as a person, I have to respect every aspect of your identity, or believe without question every anecdote you describe about your identity or your reality. For one, this statement about respecting someone without respecting their identity does not hold up in any other comparison. Religion, for example. I can respect the Mormons I live amongst in Utah as people, as fellow humans, I will be kind and accommodating, and none of that is because I believe what is in the Book of Mormon. I can respect the incarcerated, people who have committed violent crimes, even killed people. I can advocate for better living conditions against capital punishment and for their humanness. I will respect them on a basic level. I do not have to respect the belief that their crime was justified. I do not subscribe to the rules of the streets. I don't have to respect your belief that you are very smart and beautiful or handsome and always right in order to respect you as a human being. If you believe your race is something that makes you superior to other people, and boy, is that a deeply held belief for some, I'm sorry. I won't and don't have to respect this. I can respect your rights, your human rights, affirm your personhood without believing and affirming your gender identity. It is my- But you could say this actually is brave, but this is the, this is the opinion of like by far most people. So it, I don't know what, 
I don't know what that what's brave about it when by far most people believe this by far most people say this this is just everybody else's opinions repeated over and over this is i i don't like i personally know maybe like two or three people who would have an issue with this and these are people that nobody else really respects and that they don't garner any sort of following or um or power or anything so i just i don't know where I don't know how this is brave. It's like me coming out and being like, you know what, guys? Rape is bad. And I think we should respect women. And, you know what? I'm even going to take it a step further and say that we should not chop off all men's penises. I've had it. I'm going to say it. I believe that the gender identity doctrine is damaging at worst and at best completely incoherent. So let's give some background. You are wrong. As a right-wing progressive, maybe you don't run into it. LOL. Okay, sure. I, again, it's not that I don't run into it. I know these people. I know Demon Mama. I know uh, Doe. I know... Uh, what's the, what's the, what's the one on Twitch that doesn't close their legs? Polly. Yes, Polly. So there's like three people I know and they don't like, yeah, they, they don't garner a whole lot of respect or a massive following. So I, um, uh, he knows how to make a face. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tom, wrong as usual. My feminist studies have shown me that the penis is equal to misogyny and boners uphold the patriarchy. <laughs> they must be cut off to not oppress women. True. That is actually... Uh, uh, you actually have to tell me who you're quoting when you say that, Glitchin. Uh, you can't just quote feminist theory. You have to actually quote the person that you're quoting. You have to say, well... I actually re really found it compelling when J.J. Briggs said, and I quote, Tom, it is written by these nuts. Nice. Men have attributed to themselves the prototype of what it is to be human, positioning women throughout history as their inferior other. Religion, evolutionary biology, and medicine have all attributed women's inferior status to her defective body or biology rather than the political organization of women as a sex class. Because of this, women for decades have argued and fought to be recognized as equal. Arguing against this misogynist definition of women's body, arguing gender identity is culture and not nature. Separating biological sex from gender, what is imposed on them. Why would you show British people? Ugh. So, sex and gender, what is the distinction? In the mid-20th century, a terminological distinction in modern English known as the sex and gender distinction between biological sex and gender began to develop in the academic areas of psychology, sexology, and feminism. Before the mid-20th century, it was uncommon to use the word gender to refer to anything but grammatical categories. In the 1970s, feminist theory embraced the concept of a distinction between biological sex and the social construct of gender. Most contemporary social scientists, behavioral scientists and biologists, many legal systems and government bodies and intergovernment agencies such as the WHO make a distinction between gender and sex. Before the terminological distinction between biological sex and gender as a role developed, it was uncommon to use the word gender to refer to anything but grammatical categories. For example, in a bibliography of 12,000 references on marriage and family from 1900 to 1964, the term gender does not even emerge once. Analysis. Be honest. <laughs> Is that a screenshot from Wikipedia? <laughs> Shut up. Shut up! <laughs> uh. This is of more than 30 million academic article titles from 1945 to 2001 showed that the uses of the term gender were much rarer than the uses of sex and were often used as a grammatical category early in this period. By the end of this period, uses of gender outnumbered uses of sex in the social sciences, arts, and humanities. 
It was in the 1970s that feminist scholars adopted the term gender as a way of distinguishing socially constructed aspects of male-female differences, gender, from biologically determined aspects of sex. In 1945, Madison Bentley defined gender as the socialized averse of sex. Simone de Beauvoir's 1949 book, The Second Sex, has been interpreted as the beginning of the distinction between sex and gender in feminist theory, although this interpretation is contested. Sexologist John Money coined the term gender role and was the first to use it in print in a scientific trade journal. In a seminal 1955 paper, he role and was the first to use it in print in a sign is contested. Rap. That's the beginning of the distinction between. So, Sassafras, I would just like to point this out to you real quick, okay? So. It is B E A U. In French? How do you say it in French? Or how do you say it in American? Between sex and gender in feminist theory, although this interpretation is contested. Sexologist John Money coined the term gender role and was the first to use it in print in a scientific trade journal. In a seminal 1955 paper, he defined it as quote, all those things that a person says or does to disclose themselves as having the status of a boy or man, girl or woman, end quote. The modern academic sense of the word in the context of social roles of men and women dates back to at least 1945 and was popularized and developed by the feminist movement from the 1970s onward. They theorized that human nature is essentially epicene and social distinctions based on sex are arbitrarily constructed. In this context, matters pertaining to this theoretical process of social construction were labeled matters of gender. So in the 1980s to the 1990s, post-structuralism, theorists, and postmodernism and queer theory developed the theory of social constructionism beyond the social construction of the human body and began to dispense any strict definition or attention to the body really whatsoever. Social constructionism is a theory of knowledge that holds that characteristics typically thought to be immutable and solely biological, such as gender, race, class, ability, and sexuality, are products of human definition and interpretation shaped by cultural and historical context. So basically... I mean, that... So that's just true, though. Like, it's just true that the that these things are just like the way that we choose to define them. We cut lines where we choose to cut lines. We section things off the way that we choose to section it off. We categorize things the way that we choose to categorize it. Most of the time it's going to be based on some sort of utility. It's going to be based on like what we think matters the most in that scenario. We'll cut it. We'll, we'll, you know, section it off in that way, but there isn't some like objective thing that says this is where it has to start and begin and end and stuff like that right so like your heart doesn't necessarily have to be just the heart with like a couple of you know tubes hanging off of it we can say your heart is like your entire cardiovascular system instead it's not uh it's not objectively one thing but we section it off as one thing it could be your heart could be just like a section of the heart and we can say oh well that part's the heart and actually like these other parts like it, like it's just yes we are choosing to categorize things in different places and section them off in different places so that we can communicate them better that is all we're doing it they are not objectively different things but we put different words to them so that we can communicate them separately art is a lie nothing is real basically nothing matters that's not uh, that is the, the, this is just not that is not at all like this is the this is the straw man of it it's not that nothing matters it's not that nothing is real it's nothing like that it's that we are recognizing how we come to these definitions or how we came to understand these things that's it it's like we're we're um reverse engineering our own understanding of uh of language that's all material reality doesn't matter you know a lot of these philosophers have definite points but i think it personally becomes very black and white and becomes very incoherent when you say that material reality does not exist 
this is what happens when you're overeducated, you, your parents have too much money, you have too much college education, and you don't have enough real life experience, in my personal humble opinion. So transgender ideology becomes born of that goo. So if you start off like this, it just makes it sound like you just don't understand it. Like that's what anybody who understands it is going to take from this. Oh, she just doesn't get it. Like if instead you were like, and that all makes perfect sense, but we don't actually engage in the world in that way. And so I'm just kind of discount. I'm just going to discount all of that. That would be fine. That would be a totally different thing. If you were just like, you know what? That's fine. It makes sense if you want to over intellectualize this, but we do not engage in the world in this way. We still engage with social constructs. We still engage with these things as the real world. They still affect us. And until these have been broken down and thrown away, we still uh, they are still very real to us. That that would be a totally different answer. And then you can move past it in the same exact manner, just without sounding like you have no clue what you're talking about, because doing this instead says now everything from here forward just go ahead and believe that i don't understand what it is that i'm talking about that if there are other possibilities out there i obviously don't get them tom i don't want to talk about the format of the article shut the hell up you know you know you know uh who he did not say that to you know uh we actually were going I, i'm working with another podcast and we were going to clip every moment that he said, I'm not going to answer that, no comment, like all of those things. We were going to clip it all together. There was one show, there was one interview where that just didn't happen. Where that just, there wasn't a, there wasn't a moment where he's like, uh, yeah, I'm not going to answer that. Anybody want to Anybody want to take a guess on the on the <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. I I'm so sorry. No, it no it was not President Sunday. Uh no. That was not the show. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Actually, I'm so so sorry. Uh no. No, it was not BPF. No, I'm sorry. I'm just, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I'm sorry. Just listen, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it was not Wick either. No, it was the Tom Foolery show. Uh, I'm just going to give you a hint. It was the Tom Foolery show. Ironically, transgender ideology does not get rid of biological essentialism, but really, really doubles down on it. So Judith Butler is a post-structuralist, post-modernist, non-binary female who talks about performativity theory, which is... Tom, it was you, and it wasn't possible you were simping because Max is a male. I believe the correct term is glazing for that. I'm so sorry. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so good memes. I I'm I'm so sorry. But uh I don't simp. I've never simped before in my life. I'm uh I'm a Simple. I'm, I'm a simpery. A. Yeah, there's not a there's not a good one for this. There's not a good there's not a there's not a good way to fix this meme. It's just broken. Is 
that gender is neither essential nor biologically determined, but rather it is created by its own performance and hence it is performative. I understand better this phenomena through the lens of Simone de Beauvoir's quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, end quote. Asymptomatic. Nice. Let's go. Asymptomatic. Yes, Freddy. Well done. Well done. W's in chat for Freddy, everybody. W's in chat. Freddy wins. Freddy definitely wins. Well done which is similar to what Butler said, but more compelling to me personally, constantly misrepresented to fit a trans activist agenda. What she's saying is that you're born female, and then immediately from birth, you're put into this direct factory manufacturing system. And when you've emerged, you're a proper woman. You've been built and distorted into womanhood as a female. Not that sex and gender is this immaterial idea, right? Let me be clear. A lot of people misrepresent my side of the movement. And I've been called a sex essentialist many times. This is not true. Could not be further from the truth. So this is the description of a sex essentialist or a gender essentialist. The gender essentialist claim of biology theorizes that gender differences are rooted in nature and biology. Historical views based in gender essentialism claim that there are biological causes for the differences between men and women, such as women giving birth and men going out and hunting. So sex essentialism would mean that you have innate and fixed traits just by nature of your sex. I am somewhat of a gender essentialist. Um, I, I will, I will own that. I am somewhat of a gender essentialist. It's not. Um, not fully. So I do think that lots of parts of gender is socially constructed and so i'm also a gender social constructionist um i'm somewhere in between the two and i would assume most people are like that and the problem is that these two words exist within some sort of dichotomy to where i'm not able to be placed as like one or the other i'm i'm on the spectrum but there, I do think that there are some parts, there are very few parts of gender that are probably essential. And it could be that there's like lots of, it could be that most of gender is essential. The, I, I, we can't know. But I, I don't think it's all of it. And from what I can tell, from what we know, it just doesn't. We Well, I can't even say from what we know. We just don't have enough information to know how much is or isn't essential. So, um, yeah, like there, there's a little bit that I, I obviously in my document, I, I believe is essential. But, um, but for the most part, it's socially constructed. Even the category is socially constructed and it only exists as a social construct. But... It exists as a social construct just as much as sex does. And so this is kind of the issue with people when they say, well, gender is a social construct, actually. This is something that Hunter Avalon does every time he starts talking about gender. He starts off by saying, well, gender is a social construct. It's like, do you start off by saying that every time you talk about sex as well? I bet, I bet you don't. I bet you don't ever say that. What gender is just as much socially constructed as sex is. It's just the categorization that's socially constructed. But you find it necessary to mention that every freaking time. So it's a little frustrating. But yeah, there, there's essential parts. There's constructed parts. It's going to depend on like categorizations and crap like that. Um, but also like with gender, a lot of it is pushed socially and uh, that that makes it very confusing. So, uh, so basically a sex essentialist would be like, what the, f what? Just by nature of your sex. Uh, so basically a sex essentialist would be like, okay, you're a female and there because you're a female, you are naturally submissive. I understand that she thinks like, you know, hey, it's going to be cute because I'm a girl. And so I burp 
and this is me breaking down uh, gendered barriers. The thing is, is that uh, that's a very girly burp, not a female burp. That is a that is a uh, like a, an I identify as a woman type of burp. That is a, uh, a and, and men aren't walking around burping either. So, ha. Huh. In all cases, that is the normal default. You like to do your hair, you like to paint your nails. Because you're a woman, that's what you like to do and don't stray from it. Which is quite ironic when we get to later parts of this essay. So, with this gender identity shtick, sex becomes a construction, immaterial, and gender identity becomes fixed, innate, and immovable, which has absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever and enforces sexist ideas such as a pink or blue brain. But if they did, you probably wouldn't comment on it. Every I, I have burped on stream maybe two or three times, and every time I do, everybody comments on it. So, yeah. People were pinging me. What's going on? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we're just watching it. <laughs> we're just watching this. This idea of inherent. How's it going, President Sunday? I heard. Did I hear this correctly? Uh, are you and Boots reviewing this together? Is that. Is that what I heard? I thought she said that on my stream the other day, but I could be wrong. It, it is true. Wow. Wow. Okay. That that should be interesting. Because Boots claims to be closer to Lav than she is to you. So that I I I am truly interested. Like I'm not a uh, I'm not joking. I think that that should be a a really that should be a really good conversation. Inherent gender identity is what has oppressed and imprisoned women throughout centuries. A hundred years after women get the right to vote, we are silenced into even defining our own bodies. And before you say I'm being dramatic. All turfs must die. Full offense. All turfs can die in a fire. Kill your local turf. Eliminate turf scum. Another reminder to punch a turf today. Effing kill all turfs. Yeah, this is why I stopped calling people Nazis. It, uh, Big Tech convinced me of this. To stop calling people Nazis because people advocate for violence against Nazis. So it, it, it is a bad look when people do this and you do kind of give them you give the terps ammo <laughs> all comments with one like yeah it was probably them or their moms this one has one like the rest of them eight retweets and 11 likes wow whoa that is quite the ratio So, <laughs> my belief is that a woman is a female. <laughs> Sex is not assigned at birth, it is empirically observed. My body is a material reality. My body is not a religion, it is not an ideology. Being a woman is a material reality and a life lived through cultural constructions. So, I brought up this doctrine earlier. What is the doctrine? Well, when you ask proponents of gender ideology what gender identity means, there's no stable answer. The definitions are circular and entirely question begging or completely reliant on socially constructed stereotypes about behaviors and preferences of the sexes. This is from hrc.org. One's intermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both or neither, how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. One's gender identity can be the same or different from their sex assigned at birth. Okay, this is from genderequalitylaw.org. Gender identity, noun. One's internal, deeply held sense of one's gender, which may be the same or different from one's sex assigned at birth. One's gender identity may be male, female, neither, or both, i.e. non-binary. Everyone has a gender identity. Gender identity is distinct from sexual orientation. 
So this is a frustration with a lot of orgs that talk about gender identity, where they use sexed language instead of gendered language. And it kind of it kind of causes problems and confusion. Not that like if we're talking about gender dysphoria, I think it makes a little bit more sense to mix the two because generally gender dysphoria isn't really like the it's not really the gender overall that's making them dysphoric, but the sex as well and so i i'm a bit more lenient on people mixing up the verbiage on those but not when we're just i like not when we're when we're when we're just defining what gender identity is and then we say stuff like male female you know crap like that it makes it a lot more confusing what up katie okay this is from cornell university gender identity Gender identity is a person's self-identified gender, which may or may not correspond with their sex assigned at birth. Gender identity is how a person experiences and expresses their gender. And then it goes on to talk about the Yogi Akarta principles. The Yogi Akarta principles, international human rights principles revolving around sexual orientation and gender identity, describe gender identity as each person's presentation of the person's gender through physical appearance, including dress, hairstyles, accessories, cosmetics, and mannerisms, speech, behavioral patterns. Can someone tell me why Tom is taking her seriously, just for the clicks? Uh, my views actually dropped since I started talking about this. Um, we dropped a good bit, I believe. Uh, yeah, we were at 140. And then when we started this, we dropped down to 100. So yeah, the, the clicks don't seem to be all that helpful, but yeah, yeah, sure. President Sunday. I think you have uh roles to just jump in to my VC. Patterns, names, and personal references. Many different gender identities exist, exist, including male, female, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, agender, pangender, gender queer, two-spirit, third gender, and all or none of a combination of these. So the Yogi Akarta principles are seen as the standard for gender protection laws internationally. In 2006, in response to well-documented patterns of abuse, a distinguished group of international human rights experts met in Yogi Akarta, Indonesia, to outline a set of international principles relating to sexual orientation and gender identity. The result was the Yogi Akarta Principles, a universal guide to human rights which affirm binding international legal standards in which all states must comply. Of course, these haven't been adopted everywhere, but it's been very helpful in shaping US laws, Argentinian laws, etc. In a lot of the United States, trans people have protections against discrimination as well as acknowledgement of gender identity, employment, education, and housing protection, all under the basis of gender identity. So, what is gender identity? What is the clear political definition? You'd hope that there would be one considering these laws proposed by trans activists come into contact with or override existing legal protections for other groups, other sex classes, namely females. Unfortunately, there is no clear definition. No legal document or law managed to explain the concept of gender identity in a way that is not circular, nonsensical, or reliant on socially constructed stereotypes. You'll notice about all of these definitions is the word gender on both sides. The thing to be defined and part of the hello, definition hello. itself. Perfectly circular. How's it going? I am doing swell. How are you? <laughs> doing great. I, we just started this. Um, to get past the uh, the Simone de Beauvoir section? Yes. Are you familiar at all with Simone de Beauvoir? Not really. I, I only started looking into that part, her. That, I'll, I'll say this. That part made me laugh a little bit. Why is that? Uh, well, <laughs> among other things, is she likes to default and, and there's a reason why she doesn't understand the context of this. She likes to default as a counter to Judith Butler, the phrase by Simone de Beauvoir, that one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. Oh, I'm and sorry. The reason why... Yes, yeah. I know de Beauvoir. Yes, I've, I, I've read The Second Sex, but I, I don't there's know much no... about her outside of that. Well, well it, The Second Sex is like an 800-page book, so you would know a lot about Simone de Beauvoir if you read The Second Sex. Yeah, the other um, day when I was talking to Lava about y'all's debate, that was like one of the first things I brought up, is I felt like uh, when she talks about de Beauvoir, she talks about it as the, the, a lot of the stuff that, um, like, the when you become a woman, it 
there's yes. in the footnotes it talks about the fact that there's like many different translations and they're not sure which one exactly she was saying um if it's you become a woman or if you become woman or if like there's like three different types of woman that they use in france and they well, weren't I can, sure i can provide a little bit of clarification and this is one of the reasons why it's funny okay. so do, do you recall by chance where in the book um the phrase one is not born a woman but rather becomes a woman occurs right at the beginning no, actually, it's about close to 300 pages in. It's at the beginning of volume two. Well, okay. Yeah, in the translated version, they say it at the beginning. Oh, well, it's, it's French, right? It's all translated. Yeah. But this is the actual quote, okay? Mm -hmm. One is not born, and you'll see why I find this hilarious. One is not born, but rather becomes woman. That's what Lav quotes on the screen. Mm -hmm. This is the next sentence. No biological, psychic, or economic destiny defines the figure that the human female takes on in society. It is civilization as a whole that elaborates this intermediary product between the male and the eunuch that is called feminine. Only the mediation of another can constitute an individual as another, and as much as he exists for himself. Da -da 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 -da. So you get you get the idea here. Um, not only is this not contrary Butler, they're actually uh, drinking from the same well. Um, they are both going to be taking on an understanding of gender that is entirely, and, and by gender is understood womanhood, and by the young uh, female is going to be understood the uh, the younger form yeah. of the adult woman, which is a socially conditioned category, entirely socially conditioned. She is adamant about this. Um, and they are both going to be deeply embedded in the kind of, uh, the kind of understanding of, of gender and social categories uh, that, that Lacan will be dealing with. Um, and, and moreover, more to the point, um, Simone de Beauvoir is in no way, shape or form less a social constructionist than Judith Butler. Um, Judith Butler has the benefit of being able to read Simone de Beauvoir and to elaborate on her work and be critical of it. She's, she's a little bit ahead of the current with respect, well, ahead of the current. She's, she's mm -hmm. farther downstream. From de Beauvoir. So I, I found that section absolutely hilarious because he just categorically didn't understand either de Beauvoir or Butler. It, it was really remarkable. Um, you would think after having been taken to the woodshed about that in particular multiple times in front of an audience that she would at the very least take five seconds to, you know, read the page in which this occurs. Yeah. So I, I remember in your debate with, with her, she, um, she said that she agrees that it like to everything you're saying, but she doesn't believe that Beauvoir would say that you can, uh, that a man could become a woman. That do you agree with that? Well, th that's that's the reasoning there is circular. So a man can't become a woman because a man is a conditioned category as well that is defined in opposition to woman. Mm -hmm. and this is this is again like one of the reasons why we don't say when we're talking about trans people that a man becomes a woman we we simply refer to them as a woman well a woman if with a penis Beauvoir or things like believes that, that you mm -hmm. one becomes a woman yeah. could you not become a man first and then become a woman or i guess you don't become a man because man is just the default in the second sex that so. gets that gets a little bit tricky yeah. because your self-conception is now conditioned by that already like I, I think I think the I get the the point you're getting at, and I think there's a sense in which you could, but it, it would be it'd be a bit more convoluted because what she's talking about isn't just the possibility of adopting different roles within a social mm -hmm. frame. She's also talking very much about the way in which these roles condition your self-conception and your relation with other people and their relationship with you um, from the moment you enter this world. And, and you can't repeat that, of course. That's, that's kind of a one-shot thing. You're only a baby once. You're only a child once. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit... I, I get what you're saying, and I, th I think there's something to it. I think there's something to it. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more... Uh, it's, well, it, here, here's the grand irony of the thing. It's, it's social constructionism clear. as a concrete... Yeah, so well, yes. so I that I was gonna say I I want to be clear. I'm just telling you what Lav's argument is. I yes. think no, that no. I Simone saw I saw a little Var... bit. I I saw a little bit of what you were saying when she had social constructionism on the screen and she was saying the the Bo Burnham line, art is a lie, nothing is real. And I was impressed by that. You actually were you were correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I I I. I 
I do think that the way that Beauvoir like uh, conceptualizes gender, it seems like, yes, a man or a, a male could become that. Like it is yeah. something that is forced yeah. on females, but if it was forced on a male or a male, um, a male took on those traits, then it would, it like the patriarchy would be just as much oppressive to that um to that male well, and, on and, the... and, and, and indeed it is the second yes. sex is is as much about as much about the the raising of of men in society as it is about women they take up a little less space in terms of the tax but it's a massive part of it because of course mm -hmm. like it is the second sex it is directly corresponding to the thing to which it is the other so the right. second sex is going to be defined by its relationship to the first sex right do you do you actually agree that males are or a man is the default no i think that's uh that's one of the main things that is is being challenged by by a text like this so one of the things uh, de beauvoir will argue um i probably have it actually underlined here somewhere um one of the things that de beauvoir will argue is that while it is true that even from a very very young age a very young age it may it may be the case that if female children seem to exhibit these these tendencies or whatever and they have a common experience this is entirely conditioned by how they are raised by the society it's it's a, it's a holistic process of generating a type that it sort of takes in her language to be as obvious as the moon and the stars or the moon and the sun um and and she goes down like a, a weird it's, it's a fascinating i don't know how how much weight you want to put on it but from her perspective she goes down a weird sort of psychoanalytic uh, history in the second volume of how uh, uh, women and men in childhood understand themselves diff differently by reference to how their wet nurses and their parental figures in society as a whole um, imposes on them specific relationships with their, their genitalia and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and what she's careful to point out is that uh, and that that's fascinating to look into. I don't know how much we can go into it without breaking TOS or something. But what's really uh, what's really fascinating about it is that, um, as determinative as these uh, practices are of behavior and of one's self conception and roles in society later on, um, she's careful to point out that even in terms of things like the different ways in which males and females are typically understood to urinate in a given society, these differ. By social context and things of that sort um so it's 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 and this is one of the reasons once again why de beauvoir is a little bit outdated she goes with a, a lot of material that um we are generally a lot more critical of today i'm not a de beauvoir expert i haven't read all of the second sex things a monster um but the the notion that there is uh, that that de beauvoir um in in her perspective at the very least stands as asserting the the essentiality of a biological female experience is is beyond parody it, it's it's completely the opposite of what she's doing mm -hmm. even if she's wrong i didn't oh, read the wikipedia i have the I'm sorry. yeah uh, oh. for some reason when you first brought it up i uh, when you asked me for some reason i was mixing up beauvoir and the uh what's the other Butler? chick's name no the girl who um the woman she brings up at the beginning that says right when oh andrea dworkin thing. yes dworkin that's who i was thinking of i don't know much about dworkin me, me neither um yeah yeah Tom. yes okay katie you're you're very quiet just a heads up you are you're very far away oh shit is this better yes that's much better okay um I just wanted to to answer about the the is is a man like the um, the default sex, obviously not. Um, well, if well, we're not the if sex, we so are we're talking about gender, like it, yeah, are exactly. They a I was gender? gonna say so. So like we're all acknowledging that there's a distinction between sex and genders. Like mm -hmm. sex, obviously, we know that everyone starts like more close to female, and then whatever but like in terms of gender i do believe that the default is actually uh, a man um and then like socially not just as like gender but as like um just the way society is constructed the way civilization is constructed like um and then you you branch out from that to like 
lesser men and and women and stuff like that and i think a really easy way to like see that is the way that basically living under the patriarchy like women who want to be successful um in the workplace for example need to aspire to a more like man like um behavior you know like a lot of our social institutions as well are all constructed around like the concept of men being successful mm -hmm. um so I, well, so I don't why... really disagree mm -hmm. that in some aspects that's obviously going to be the case. It, it generally, just because men uh, inhabit like the the top parts of the hierarchy within society, or like, at least like the parts that are going to hold the most power. But I think that there are lots of gendered characteristics that are forced on men as well that are going to make them different than whatever a a default could possibly be. And so it's oh their, yeah. They're like, so I think just saying they are the default is almost too... well. Well, here, here, here's the men aren't the default. Man is the default. This is this right. is, and and it's not even necessarily consistently imagined by everyone else. It's it's just like a totemic principle about it. Well, I actually so that's agree a, with I, that. So. I, that's kind of what I'm talking about is conceptually, I think that... So I want to make sure is... I wasn't talking over Katie. Did you say you agree with that or disagree with that? I said I agree with that. Okay. Good. I, I like that distinction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is I think, man, it, there are still so many things that differentiate man from what an actual default would be to where man is put up as the default, but it's still so different from what a default would be that it kind of discounts all of the gendered characteristics that are forced on men as well, in otherizing them f from women just the same as women are being otherized from men. I guess what frustrates me about that argument is like it implies that in a, in a world that is like devoid of society and civilization and everything, if there's like a real truth to it, then sure. But I'm not really talking about that. like when I'm saying um, well, that, man, I'm not, I'm not just saying default. that. I'm I'm mm -hmm. asking you to take that into consideration to understand that men are being otherized from women just as much. Like, oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, do, when you say they're otherized from women, do you mean that? I feel like, and I don't know if it was shown in the video, but I do feel like um, the way we distinguish men from women is less so much you know i'm thinking about like cry like a girl and like so um, when you say they're otherized i do agree that there are differences and that we we compare but the initial like separation is always like women are different x way and now we've we've rinsed and repeat that for a few like thousands of years so now you can go the other way around but i guess i guess the question is like do you mean generally or do we mean where did it start? Because when I'm thinking about the default, I'm thinking about where, where, like, oh, you're, you're thinking about like created. ontologically, literally, where did human beings, you're, you're thinking about the default in like a historical sense. Like, yeah. What was yeah. The oh, okay. I see. So, so I think, I think Tom's asking about a social sense. So in, in this case, yeah. like, and we can, we can sort of approach this in almost a timeless way where you're, you're right. Like initially, um, men are going to be treated as, as the actors and the center, uh, to which, women slash females slash whatever word is being used are, are an appendage. And then they're going to, after the fact, um, identify themselves as against the female, which was originally differentiated from them, which is simply. The, yes, the, the, exactly. The yeah. So, so I think, I think we were all on the like same page FMAE, about that. That's why I was right? a little bit. Yeah. 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 That's why I was a little bit perplexed about what you were saying. Cause I was like, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely on board with this. Where are you going? But I, I see what you're saying. You're talking about sort of like almost an evolutionary default, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's like an important thing to remember because when I'm thinking in terms of like deconstruction of gender and like um, from a patriarchal lens, like it is important to remember where those like core things come from because like if you want to to deconstruct a notion, for me the way I do it is like reaching the core issue is the the most effective way of doing it. So just like saying, oh, men should be um, like erudite sometimes says stuff like um, we should just encourage men to like accept their feminine side. And from like my perspective, I think because of the um, like evolutionary way, uh, quote unquote, evolutionary way socially that that like gender worked, 
I think it would be a lot harder for society to accept men being feminine than men and women being just like not a thing. You know, yeah, it would be, well, that's it would why be, what is a it, woman yeah. is a much bigger question than because there's a lot more characteristics that come with being feminine than there are with being masculine. And then yeah, like, yeah. What, when we exactly. talk about trans women all the time, we talk about trans women because it's it's males becoming uh, feminine, which is like a lot harder for people's brains to grapple. Well, with. I, I don't think I don't think it's necessarily that it conceptually it's harder for people's brains to wrap their minds around. I think I think what's happening, though. A it's a disgust of, response. It, well, well sometimes, sometimes. But I think I think what it also is is as a consequence of how these categories are framed. Um, uh, biological uh, males who transition to socially present as women um, are viewed as engaging in a different kind of act from biological females who socially present as as men. Um, namely, they are still regarded as men, whereas biological females are not regarded as men um and and so That's like there yeah yeah so so even when we're talking about like uh like like gender neutral bathrooms and things of that sort the the fear is never of of trans men um molesting young boys in the washroom it is always of trans women molesting young girls in the washroom which mm -hmm. is strange because again like back to the disgust response there is sort of an association in, in like a lot of transphobic discourse, a, a lot like within like the respected, like respected medical uh, writings going back, uh, uh, n not even a few decades in some cases, where trans women are, are treated as essentially, uh, it's it's a type of homosexuality. It's it's a type of, of Perversion, with, yeah. with, with homosexuality understood in a very circular fashion as being itself an onboarding of female tendencies onto a male. Well, we've so also gets, done a lot of very, work. It gets very odd. Over the I also last think like, that, like, couple decades, we, like feminism has done a lot of work to push women into more masculine roles and take on more masculine characteristics that's become normalized. And we haven't done the inverse for men, where it becomes more and more normalized for men to take on feminine characteristics well, or do feminine well, that's jobs. Why... That's why I really hate like the whole like um, becoming more masculine or becoming more feminine. Because again, if if I look at it from like where the default like conversation that we just had, then like the concept of becoming more masculine or becoming more feminine, um, it, it's nonsensical because we only made these distinctions as like juxtapositions to one another where yes. we all understand that like we could have all just started from the same place so i guess i have a very like um strong um emotional like resentment towards that type of discourse mm -hmm. and i understand that maybe most people need it to like make an easier sense of the world um but like referring to what president sunday said like i think that there's a much greater because of because there are very very few like as tom said like there are more ways to describe and distinguish like a woman from a man but in terms of being a man there are very core principles that you should generally follow under like a patriarchal lens and like becoming a woman is one of the big no-nos you know like being feminine um participating in those feminine traits and i think a lot of the tra anti-trans discourse comes from this um feeling of almost like a gender traitor as a man that you could ever like give up and like betray the concept of manhood to to become like the lesser form of a woman type of thing so you'll always be like a cheap imitation yes. I'm going to disagree with that a little bit. I don't think, and I mean, maybe you can find people who do think this way, but I don't think it's so much betraying the concept of a man as if man is like a, a gender faction that, that is owed loyalty to. I, no, I think it's like it's, defiling it is what I mean. I wouldn't even necessarily say that. I, I don't think, I don't think masculinity or manhood as such is, is, is touched by that conceptually in the imaginations of people who, who hold that kind of thing. I think, I think what it really is is that the inferiority of women is such a baked in component of this that it is read as men wanting to shirk responsibilities return to the womb so to speak and and become kind of coddled by society um and things of that sort and that's taken to be in inherently di dishonorable or, or some other word like that i think that's that's more the the read on it and this is why it dovetails okay. with kind of the disgust at, at gay people right 
because that's so that's, that's, that's read in a similar way. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, from what you said, that's pretty much, um, I guess, like a specific example of the general vibe I was describing, because mm. even like, because for me, when I'm saying like a gender traitor, I mean that like, you're a man and if you're trying to dodge your responsibilities as a man and like trying to return to the womb, that's very like unmanly. It's one of those things that you're oh, exactly. not supposed to do as a man. Yeah, that's but what, what, what is what is what is the manly but but the the opposite of, of, of the womanly, which is precisely like and this is something Beauvoir goes exactly. into uh, extensively, like the, the girl is allowed to hide behind her mother's skirt. The, the boy is not past a certain age. Um, before I go, I, I need to run because I'm, I'm super busy tonight. Um, this is actually Tom is doing a remarkably, surprisingly good job on this. Um, so well done there. Uh, you've been, <laughs> you've been uh, highly praised, uh, Katie. Uh, Femoid is in the chat and then uh, she says you've explained patriarchy wonderfully. So take I that. I did. What you I, will. Saw that. <laughs> I saw oh, that. I saw that. Yeah. Lav, um, you needed to read. Oh, Lav, God. if you're still there, you needed to read literally. Just, just to avoid embarrassing yourself with this, thirty pages. That's all you had to do. Just, just take take an hour or two. It's not hard. It's not hard. Anyways, here you go. Godspeed. Wait, wait, was he saying thirty pages of gender trouble? I think he means like Simone de Beauvoir. Oh. Um, I was about to say, 30 pages of gender trouble is hard, dude. I probably had to do the first 30 pages like three or four times. <laughs> it is freaking rough, dude. <laughs> uh, sick. I, I have no reason to stay, so you um, you you can just come in because I have no... I don't think Tom needs me here. I just wanted to answer the question. <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Sorry I barged in. No problem. No attempt is made to define gender. We understand through reading these, you know, what it could possibly mean. And that is a deeply felt internal experience. What you feel yourself to be. Even moving off of these not defining gender, it doesn't tell us how this feeling is different from any other felt feeling having I'll screw with this. nothing to do with gender. So a deeply felt internal experience. It doesn't extrapolate on where this feeling comes from, its relation to the body and biological sex, nor does it speak on its relation to our environment. And nurture. It doesn't describe why this feeling should be taken seriously or as gospels, as so it can be protected under legislation, which one would wish for it to do when there are laws being pushed to override existing legislation and protections based on sex that we need, that we fought very hard for. If you're like me, this instead doesn't give you hope, but doesn't make much sense and gives you actually very little hope that laws can be proposed and enacted to protect a characteristic of human identity. And none of the people pushing for it really care to define what they're protecting. So the preamble to these laws often has to do with the utterance that these transgender people will experience violence, marginalization, harassment, exclusion, and prejudice because of their gender identity. And if this exists, surely this gives us a reason to legislate protection, but it's not clear how it can be true based off of their circular definitions. What does it mean for someone to suffer from discrimination or violence based on an internal belief about themselves rather than on an outward presentation? How do you protect a subjective state? Without telling us what an internal sense of yourself means, how can I know if I have a personal definition of myself if I don't know if I don't know what any of this means? A deeply felt we we have all sorts of laws that are based on some sort of subjectivity. Um like lots of self-defense laws are based on whether or not you have a legitimate threat to your life. Right? You can you can actually take action and like kill somebody if you have a legitimate fear for your life and then when you look at what a legitimate fear is those are all based on subjective markers as well lots of our laws lots of things that we put into legislation are subjective we protect subjectivity all the time like whether or not like rape is a it has lots of subjective markers to it as well. Like whether or not you've consented to something has lots of subjective markers to it as well, which is why we have a jury of your peers. Grade these things it's because we want what it is that we're looking at to be a representation of what most people would agree with 
a subjective state of human identity. Well, probably not of human identity, but I don't understand why, why wouldn't we have a subjective state of human identity in law when we have so much other subjectivity in, in law as well? Like, that's kind of the point that I'm making is that like, why not an identity? Why, why can so many other things be subjective and not, and not identity? strong sense of identification of man or woman, male or female. How can I acquire this deeply felt feeling of my identity? What is its relationship to my sex body? If I'm being told this feeling is so important, it must be legislated to protect, then I'd like to- Because it's legalizing calling yourself beautiful and being protected in that class. Wait, no, it's not. You can still have separate legal definitions. Even if we're talking about, like, even if we say, yes, woman is this thing, uh, law can say, well, we're not talking about, like, woman. We're talking about females, right? Like, they, they can say, we're just talking about adult human females or something like that. Like, they're still able to differ differentiate these things if they wanted to. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I don't see why they couldn't do that is my point. Like, I, I don't think they would, but I don't see why they couldn't do it. I'm saying, how do we protect gender identity outside of expression? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, I don't know. Because I... I I'm trying to steel man this. I I don't personally want to protect protect gender identity in and of itself because I think that you would have to use expression as some sort of uh, litmus test for gender identity, but I'm not sure. To know where these feelings come from and why they're so important. I believe many things about myself and my identity that nobody cares about protecting. Where are my protections as a beautiful, tortured, and thoughtful artist? My protections as a 5'8 genius with beautiful long legs. So, because the subject of- Wait, you're not 5'8. Wait, did you say 5'8? Hold on. Gender. My protections as a 5'8. Oh, you identify as 5'8. Okay. Why they're so important. I believe many things about myself and my identity that nobody cares about protecting. Where are my protections as a beautiful, tortured, and thoughtful artist? My protections as a 5'8 genius with beautiful long legs. So, because the subject of gender and everything I've read about it is so... Tom, how tall are you? 5'2". Uh, confusing. Gender identity needs to be more than a preference or affinity to attributes and roles associated to a sex. The consensus is that gender identity is as fixed as sexual orientation, meaning we should not try to shape or influence it. Trying to shape or change someone's gender identity, encouraging them to reflect, is seen as wrong and abusive. People often explain that trying to relay a biological sex to a trans person is akin to sexual conversion therapy. People explicitly argue that the only form of psychotherapy should be one that affirms and supports the professed gender identity. Even therapy geared towards young people. The kind that wishes to wait and see how your identity could play out and change while you remain a minor is considered dangerous and abusive now, i.e. protect trans kids. All of this makes sense if you believe gender identity is fixed at a young age, perhaps even before birth. Being trans is obviously- Like, I don't understand. So, I'm just, I'm, I'm a bit lost on like the, because saying that you protect gender identity doesn't mean that you would protect people identifying as beautiful like it it those are not nearly equal if you wanted to say an employer cannot discriminate based on gender identity all that matters is that they do identify as something and somebody would discriminate against them based on that identity that's all that that's literally all that matters is that it doesn't matter how you de decide whether or not that identi that identification is actually real or that identity is real or legitimate you can jump in lav you have perms
Yep. Hi. So when we talk about subjective states, especially in the scope of gender, we're talking about a deeply intrinsic feeling. So I'm, I'm going off of what, uh, you know, the HRC describes gender identity as, which is mm -hmm. a, just a deeply held belief or feeling that is not rooted in necessarily like reality, right? It's identifying right. actual sex. So that, which is a subjective state, how do you even explain what a woman feels like, how it is to feel like a woman, and why would we protect that? It's like describing uh, beauty in the way that like beauty is subjective. Why would we, why would we protect a human state, a subjective state, mental state, that is completely sort of random and arbitrary over, you know, expression? I believe What does in arbitrary mean? Arbitrary means random. Okay. Why, why am I always getting quizzed? This is so stupid. I hate you. <laughs> this is so fucking annoying. Like, I'm sorry. I'm just trolling you because uh, I don't even want like, to dignify Boots this shit. asked you what arbitrary meant the other day. You you laughed at it, so I was just going to yes, ask because, you. Yes, uh, because I Boots is, Boots is debate tactics. I know why you laughed at it. I don't, I don't want to get into a whole like, thing about uh, Boots. It's, explain I'm this. Sorry explain I asked. this. I'm sorry I asked. Anyway. I don't want to get into a thing about Boots. But you know what, I, but you, okay. but you know what I'm saying is that... It's a, a subjective state. I agree, like every anything, that we should be able to um, have, you know, like religious freedoms, like freedom to express our religions, right? Um, sure. Or freedom to express the way that you want to express yourself. That should be protected because that is tangible. That's measurable. That's a, that's a, you know, you can empirically sort of view and observe uh, people's expression of things. Uh, you can't do that with gender identity. So it makes no sense to well, um, protect under legislation and so, you get job protections in america and in argentina and in uruguay and in sweden and maybe not sweden anymore so Germany. you read you said you read my doc did you really yes okay so you would know that in my doc i say that your identity can't really have any utility if it's separate from your um if it's separated from your uh uh performance so yes like I, I obviously agree, but that would just mean that we would measure it based on your performance. That doesn't mean that somebody well, can't yeah, have so, a different identity, but that yeah. identity wouldn't be protected by law. Yeah, so what I'm doing in this, in, which hopefully you'll get throughout the the video, is that um, I, make a, 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 I make a bunch of arguments. So not only do I make the argument that we shouldn't protect the, the state, but that the presentation itself is very sexist and arbitrary, like based on arbitrary sex stereotypes so we shouldn't give any of that merit um so, so it's sort of like it knocks it down one by one but also keeps in mind that like you know if you are a man who doesn't fit into your you know what you're supposed to like that doesn't make you less of a man that just means that you're a man and you want breasts and you want hair and you should be protected under law to do those things to express those things you should have job security you should have housing security because of those things but not under the guise of you being a woman but under the guise of you being someone free to, free to express themselves so are so okay i i have like a million questions based on like one thing that you said um i don't want to get into a debate about it i'm just trying to understand what you're saying so um when we talk about like religious protections you're saying there's ways that we can measure that in your life um in the way that you live and the things that you do right mm -hmm. the Though, would those not also be based on stereotypes about those religions? I don't really understand your question. So are you against the stereotypes because you think that they're sexist? Um, I'm against the give. I'm not against stereotypes. It's too broad. No, I'm against the, the stereotypes. We're talking about gendered stereotypes right now. Yeah, I'm the not against. Yeah, I'm not against stereotypes in general. I'm. Uh, I'm against whether or not performing those can make you into something that you're not and giving them merit. So because then, then then that becomes gender essentialism. That becomes that becomes biological essentialism in which you think that, you know, because you don't like that you can't hold feminine traits as a man, like you have to be a woman because of that. Can you tell me why you're okay with that with religion and not with gender? 
Wait, what do you mean? So we're going to we're going to grade somebody uh, like if somebody says like, oh, I'm being discriminated based on being Muslim. And then we go look at their life and they don't have any of the stereotypical but the, Muslim. But they uh, are. But Muslim is not <laughs> Muslim is based off of a, if, of a off of a philosophy and religion. Right. Mm -hmm. Being yeah. man or woman is is based off of uh, what, what is a conglomeration of subjective and material reality. So it's based off of mostly sex. So when you say that you're a woman and you can change your you know ID from male to female, it becomes like it has in basis it is different because you are okay you are, so you, you are just entering a, a said, protected class that is is not on. as subjective you, as a hold religion on, hold on, hold on. you said that we were going to grade them based on uh sexist stereotypes and so i'm saying i agree with you we would have to look at sexist stereotypes but with religion we're also using stereotypes in order to figure out whether or not they are actually that religion. And I'm asking, why would we do, why is that okay wait, with religion and stereo, not with gender? Wait. First of all, there's a stereo, <laughs> religions have a rule book. They have the Quran, they have the Bible, they have- Correct, but how do we know whether or not there are that no, There is no is rule book. <laughs> there's no rule book for man or woman. Though. That's not what I'm asking. I don't know why you keep bringing but that I don't, up. I We're, don't know what you're okay. asking. Um, okay, so earlier we talked about the fact that in order to know whether or not somebody is actually religious, we would have to use like religious stereotypes to actually figure out whether or not they really are that religion if they're being discriminated based on being that religion, right? Okay. And so I'm saying, that we would still use stereotypes to actually figure out whether or not they are that religion under uh like for some sort of like legal what, like what stereotypes do you mean so like if uh, say somebody said they didn't get hired because they're muslim we would look into their life to see if their actual are, are actual stereotypical muslim practices or muslim iconography or like you know, just general Muslim things that we would stere stereotypically see with a Muslim. Sure, but that's not as much stereotypes as it is just like what it is to be part of a religion. So that's like pretty essential. Uh, what is essential to a religion is is performing the religion. What is not essential to womanhood is being is performing womanhood. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is, that is my issue is that you, it sounds like you're describing the same thing. It like, when I talk about womanhood, I'm saying, yes, it is somebody who's yes, actually womanhood, practicing no, but, womanhood. But plenty of people, plenty of people do not practice womanhood who do not do practice womanhood with the stereotypes. And they're still women. If you are a Muslim who does not practice being Muslim, who does not, you know, do the things that Muslims do, then you are not Muslim because that is a prerequisite to be Muslim. You need to do those things. It is not a prerequisite to womanhood to perform arbitrary <laughs> femininity uh, rules based on stereotypes. Well, I'm saying it is. B but it's not. There are plenty of butch women who are still women. You can say that, but I say it is. They're still, okay, when I'm not wearing makeup, when I have my hair cropped, when I'm wearing, you know, sweats and a t-shirt, and I'm not doing anything and i'm alone in my room i'm still a woman i'm not performing it there are yeah of course women. if i take Lesbian, legs off of Brittany a chair Griner, there's Brittany still Griner's legs of a chair oh god i hate this argument <laughs> there's not when britney britney griner is uh, is a woman uh, mm -hmm. but does not perform femininity in the fucking slightest in fact most people think that she's trans most people can't don't believe that she's a female but she's still a woman even if she's not uh presenting that way which is not true of of religion you literally have to as a prerequisite follow the set of rules there are no rules to womanhood as there are to religion okay i in my document i go over all of this where like sex characteristics are play into gendered stereotypes as well they are gendered characteristics as well and so somebody who's a butch lesbian still has those sex characteristics which is how they That's uh still add true to the uh gendered characteristics that come up with an overall concept of womanhood i yeah i just don't i still don't understand what you're um i have to rewrite it i realize there's a lot of like screwed up parts in there that i didn't explain very well so i it's mostly written for like right wingers to read and yeah. uh anybody who actually has like more 
in-depth knowledge on theory, they're going to have like a lot of uh, trouble. They're going to make a lot of assumptions that I don't mean to actually be there. So I got to rewrite a lot of it. Yeah, you do. Shut up. You're letting me off the hook. Yeah, I know. You're, uh, I didn't push back hard enough. Dude, you're you're so stupid. I saw the little fucking videos that you post with me and them. You are milking this whole you like me and you don't want anyone to know that you like me and it's I've so said good. I like you Have like a, a million phone. times. You are Have such a, a freaking liar, comment. dude. Oh, I have dude. said I like you a million times. <laughs> and then you post videos that are like <laughs> like <laughs> that are trying to shit on me when I'm cooking. What? You like you try to like virtue signal that I'm like crazy or stupid. You're so cringe. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I have said this a million times. I like Mr. Girl. I like you. I like Destiny. I like all of you for the same reasons. You're all very odd. You're all very strange. You're all very different. I like President Sunday and and Demon Mama. Like I like all of these people who are very different to me, and that like th these are people that have very different ideas that I can engage with, that I can explore, that actually challenge my ideas and make me better. I like all of these things. You're a freaking character too. You're funny. I like all of these things. That doesn't mean I don't still disagree with a lot of the dumb stuff that you do and say. That's that's like a totally different thing. I don't ever pretend like I don't no. like you that's not a th no, that you, I but you do this thing where i think that you probably do think that i'm smart and i think that you probably don't think that I'm i've not said that too crazy. i've said but, i i've argued you, with my chat a million times saying that i don't I know dude smart. i okay well i haven't seen it all i've seen is for you to fucking virtue chat, signal your fucking will you chat. back me up here i have had so many fights with them over whether or not you are smart because they all keep saying like oh i don't get what you see here tom you keep saying she's smart that's not real this is all the freaking time dude this is why they call me a simp is because even though i i have all of these issues with you i still say things about you that are nice and that's what gets all of them up in a uh, you know their panties up in a lot is because i say things that i'm not supposed to say so yeah whatever buddy i'll, I'll believe it when i see it okay. i'll be watching anyway keep keep, <laughs> going, keep going over the video bye <laughs> all right bye No idea what you're talking about, Tom. You seem pretty fake. Thanks. That's well done. Difficult. I've had many trans friends. I have been in many trans spaces and I've heard their grievances. It causes distress and could lean down a path of stigmatization, marginalization, potentially expensive dysphoria relieving surgery. We are told constantly trans lives are difficult and that they face a greater number of barriers. And She's so dumb, dude. I She is so dumb. I keep telling you guys this. I don't know why you guys argue with me all the time. She is so freaking dumb. This is, this is obvious. Whoa. What? Chill with the bears. My goodness. That is a lot of freaking bears. Wait, does the chat on screen only show... Oh, do I have to change this to get it into... It's in top chat. Well, I can't just click on it. It's not like actually projecting anything. So I don't, I'll have to figure out how to get it in the live chat. Obstacles. If this is true, why would we maintain transgender identity over encouraging an identity that is more in line with their birth sex? I wonder why we help female children become boys, how that is somehow a better clinical goal than helping them feel comfortable being a girl. And the only way that this makes sense is if you value transgender identity. Speak easy raid. Nice. Appreciate it. Speak easy. I, I, it didn't pop up on my side for some reason. It didn't, I've got my phone here in front of me. It didn't pop up there. It didn't pop up on my chat here. I don't know why, but I appreciate the raid. Thank you. Um, here, try try posting a bunch of bears again. Let's see if it's in top chat yet. Over cisgender identity. If you're logical and what you're aiming to do is reduce harm, then the evidence we have suggests the best way to do that is to have a child happy with the body they were. Oh, you can't raid. Okay, appreciate it. Born in. 
if not only to shield them from medical costs and a long road of body modification. And then if that doesn't work, if all else fails, only then to aid in a transition. But trans rights activists and advocates are not logical, and they are certainly not neutral about identity outcomes. They believe gender is fixed and innate and cannot be changed. They believe any attempt to mold or sway a gender identity in some way will also ultimately fail and also cause damage to the individual. Even people who feel like a woman one day and a man the next were expected to believe even their identity is fixed, innate, and cannot be changed. But we can't all be gender fluid because if we were all gender fluid, then their whole system of gender identity would dissipate. So the belief gender identity is fixed also is Tom literally not going to comment on any of this? Wait, what What in there do you... Yes, gender is fixed. What would I disagree with on there? Gender is fixed. Yes, true. Gender identity is fixed. It is a fixed thing. Lav has borderline personality disorder. She isn't dumb. She has a lack of sense of self. So her opinions and views challenge all the time or change all the time, sorry. Uh, trust me, I have an aunt with BPD. I know people with BPD. No, it's not, LMAO what? Yes, it is. Gender identity is fixed. I don't know why you're saying no, it's not. Gender identity is fixed, yeah. Look, it's strange very, very quickly. Claims Leah Thomas has always been a woman. Claims Caitlyn Jenner has always been a woman. Caitlyn Jenner, who lived more than 60 years. Your gender presentation is not fixed, but your gender identity, yes, this is something that you don't choose, you can't change, you can't uh, move. What you claim your gender identity is and what it, your, it actually is can be different things. But I, yeah, I believe that your gender identity is fixed for sure. The man, an Olympian. Even for those 60 years Caitlyn was living as Bruce, she really had been a woman. The only way this can make sense is if you evolve gender identity as something essential that lives inside you from birth, waiting to be uncovered, dormant until it isn't, waiting for you to be who you've always been all along. Quote, I'm not transitioning because I want to become a woman. I'm already a woman. End quote. Well, if you're already a woman. Well, and especially from like trans activists, like they believe that gender identity is fixed as well. So like when somebody, like she just said, when somebody transitions, they'll say, oh, well, they were always a woman. They... They just figured it out, right? Like they're, this is the general consensus on gender identity is that, yeah, it is a, it is a fixed thing. Woman, then what are you transitioning to and from? For this to be true, gender needs to be entirely independent from the sex body. Penises become female if the person who has it believes themselves to be or identifies as a woman. And girl parts become man. So gender identity needs to be universal. Everyone must experience gender identity. So I don't have a deep internal experience of myself as a woman. I call myself a woman, not because I feel like one, whatever that means, but because I am female. I have breasts, a vagina, ovaries, a uterus. My understanding of a woman is adult human female. In my brain, okay, well, I have the parts. I'm a female, so the word that we have for that is, is woman, and so I'm a woman. But gender identity tells me those things don't make me a woman. My body doesn't make me a woman, my sexed body. Because some people who have these things don't identify as women, they identify as men. So my breasts, my vagina, my uterus can't make me a woman. So if I'm a woman, it must be because I identify as one. Because I have the gender identity of woman. I must identify as a cisgender woman. Biology and physiology of womanhood hold no weight and I'm to accept that. I'm to accept all that makes me a woman is to Simply identify as one. I have like this is it, this is all dumb. Like it, but she's right. Like this is what the like uh, trans activists say. This is it is stupid stuff. This is their this is their line of logic. It is circular and stupid, and um, it doesn't make sense. But the, like she's right. This is what they say. So I I don't know. I don't. I, there's not much to there's not much to get upset with except for that like leftists are freaking crazy like i don't know what to tell you I have the gender identity of woman regardless of whether i recognize it and but your own doc kind of agrees no no it does not i my own doc 
completely throws gender identity out the window. Like, it it kind of says, like, yeah, gender identity exists. It's real. It's what causes you to have a gender expression. And so we just look at the gender expression that is your gender identity. That's... That's it. That's a privilege in trans oppression, if I deny it. Well, maybe there are different ways of becoming a woman then. Maybe some women are women because they're female and socialized and raised to be, like lambs for the slaughter. And maybe other people become women because they have this thing I don't have. This deeply felt intrinsic feeling. But the people pushing to legislate can't accept that. They cannot allow more than one way of becoming a man or woman. Yeah, I heard about Joe Rogan. That's sad. All people who are women must be women in the same way for the same reasons. If we had other definitions of gender, this would leave room for some experience of, of gender to be seen as more authentic than others. It would create distinctions or a hierarchy of classes for women. So people with penises who feel as though they're women, they will not be seen as sufficiently women compared to natal females. For that reason, gender identity needs to be the sole criteria to be part of the class of man or woman. There cannot be any other way of becoming a man or woman other than identifying as one. If you're a woman, you have to identify as one. Any other reason you'd be a woman, irrelevant. Your biology, physiology. Lav, you're betraying your fellow woman. Women, a trans woman is not an authentic woman. What? Mac, bro, your comprehension is just so low. It it actually hurts. You're literally, you start off by saying she's betraying her fellow women and then you state her position right afterwards. That That is her position, is that a trans woman is not an authentic woman. That is her position. That I don't know how you always do this. I don't know how you always do this where you you act like you're disagreeing with somebody and then you state their position as your own. But there it is again. It's insufficient. So because most of the planet calls themselves men or women, it must be because they possess this deep intrinsic feeling, right? Oh, and also there are people who can decide to opt out of being a man or woman, agender or non-binary, but those people have a gender identity. Their identity just isn't man or woman, but uh, something else, some... Some thing. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Some immaterial experience, I suppose. So, when I tell people about how I feel about my gender, they tell me that I'm something, like, non-binary. They explain that I do have a gender identity, it's just one of the outliers, it's just pretty special. But if I call myself non-binary, I am not a woman anymore. I can't be. But I've been a woman my entire adult life because of my body. But I can't call myself a woman because I don't identify as one. I don't have this deeply personal identification and feeling. And so for anybody who's a cis woman, you don't know much about your gender identity because you it aligns with your sex. It is so seamless for you that you don't ever have to think about your gender identity. You don't ever have to actually uh, like rationalize it in any way. You don't have to contemplate it in any way. So obviously you're not going to have this deep you know, connection with your gender identity. It aligns with your sex. Of course not. It's it's like 99% of the 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 like population. So yeah, duh. Well done. You you're like everybody else, so you don't have to think about your gender identity very much. But I I I have a gender identity. I'm a cis male. I know I have a gender identity. I know that I would feel very uncomfortable if people looked at me as a woman and identified me as a woman. I would probably develop some sort of dysphoria over it, as would Lav. And she can pretend that's not the case, but she would definitely end up developing gender dysphoria if everybody acted like she was a man. And she'll say, well, that's actually because I've been socialized as a woman. But no. Nope. Again, how can I even begin to have this feeling or try to have it if I can't explain what it is or what it means to feel like a woman? If your personality, disposition, and preferences are more aligned to the gender norms of one sex, 
or the other sex rather than your natal sex if you have the feeling you are more comfortable or belong to another gender role than another maybe if that's all that means but again where does gender identity come from and why should we protect this thing in law of course i can live more comfortably as a woman i've been raised and socialized to be one for 24 years i've had good practice it's all I've ever known how to do. I know how to exist as a female, as an adult female. And when I look at the pink bow and blue tie, I feel nothing. I like to do my makeup. I like to look cute. I'm also fairly aggressive. Certainly people feel like their sex does not align with the societal conceptualization of how their sex should behave or what things they should prefer. But nobody has explained to me what about that feeling needs to be protected. Immediately I think, why don't we just get rid of the pink bow and the blue bow tie. Surely we'd all be just fucking happier. We want to protect people from discrimination on the basis of their gender identity and how they express that identity, but that doesn't mean gender identity itself is something to be protected in legislation. Maybe instead we should be creating a world in which nobody would need to have a gender identity. Since nobody needs to define themselves in reference to these stereotypical personality boxes. Gender identity needs to be in order for this doctrine to ring true and these laws to be sacrosanct. Something more than a feeling tying you to a set of arbitrary rules and stereotypes you're supposed to feel attached to your sex. Gender is either a material or immaterial property. If it's material in basis, it must be verifiable. It must be capable of testing. You must be able to find the property known as gender identity. What is this if not a gendered brain? The concept of this fixed identity has to rely, because we don't have souls, I'm an atheist, has to rely on the brain. So what is the concept of sexed brains? To be fair, even trans rights activists rarely make claims of a gendered brain because of how on its face misogynistic and false it is, but boy, is it alluded to. It lurks in the shadows. Gina Rippon, who is much more qualified to speak on me than this, so the differences we're talking about are actually very tiny. They may be statistically significant, but if you've got a big enough data set, but they're actually very small. And what we ignore, and this is where sort of my autism research interests came in, we ignore the variability within each group. So the differences within groups of males and females are much bigger than the differences between them. And even dyed in the wool sex difference um, uh, researchers will acknowledge that actually the differences they're talking about are quite small. I'll link the lecture. Suffice to say, she obliterates the idea of a gendered brain, as many neuroscientists have. I, saying that the differences are small does not obliterate the idea of a gendered brain. The like, gender is a small part of our of our persons. Like, it is a small, tiny aspect of who we are, and. It, obviously, there's going to be very small differences. And within those small differences, it would make sense that gender is one of those things. It, it doesn't make sense that Lav will start talking about, yes, there are these like biological differences that come from like testosterone and estrogen and that they're going to have these massive differences in the way that we act. It it's literally gender like it's you're literally explaining gender and then we're talking about brains that are made to or or uh or or yes that change based on estrogen and and testosterone it's not fixed it's not innate we don't know that you don't know that they don't know that nobody knows that we we don't have enough information about the brain to actually know that. But we do know that some of the differences seem to align fairly consistently. We don't know why. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know if it's innate or if it's uh, if it if it's developed because of society. We have no freaking idea. You said it's fixed, Tom. A gendered brain is different than a gendered identity. I said a gender identity is fixed, not a gendered brain. There are differences in brains between the sexes, but there's absolutely no evidence of gender. And the emphasis we put on the differences in the brain are really, really insignificant. And That's what gender is. Like, uh, this is frustrating when people describe gender and then they're like, and there's no, no evidence of gender right after describing gender. Frankly, very dumb. So go watch the lecture and come back. I'll wait. Sex differences are going to come out as gender differences. That's the way that we'll categorize them as feminine and masculine. Femininity and masculinity are things that we consider um, <clears throat> to be like a, 
attributes from a specific sex, right? Uh, like you look up femininity, it's something closely related to females and masculinity, something closely related to males. So these are, you know, characteristics or traits that you expect or, um, or are likely of a sex or, or sorry. So yeah, if it's feminine, it's, it's expected or likely of females. Like that's what femininity is. Lots of those feminine things are going to be biological. Lots of masculine things are going to be biological. <laughs> so even if we were to grapple with the idea of a sex brain, you'd have to explain how a male brain got into a female body or vice versa. So like what? Like, uh, I mean, it, unless you think there's no differences based on, uh, estrogen and testosterone i'm sure you at least believe that much so just the just those differences alone are are things that we would consider to be biological differences um that we would categorize as masculine and feminine like being more aggressive uh building more muscle um you know being more empathetic uh, crying more easily or being more emotional, being less emotional. Like these are all things that we consider to be feminine or masculine. Tom, you need to watch the lecture. Okay. Or read a damn book. Well, I have read many books on this, but I, we've already talked about this in our debate where you conceded that I was right. So maybe you need to watch my lecture. How about that? If we believe that a female brain can be placed inside a male body, we have to agree on these highly contestable and tested claims. One, there are significant differences between male and female brains, enough to make the distinction. And two, we have to have an explainable theory as to how one sexed brain can end up in another sexed body. Even if it were true brains were sexed, you need some explanation for the second claim, that a female brain can be placed in a male body with male chromosomes and testes and a penis or vice versa. But also, why would we call a brain a female brain if it exists in a male body? If we're to believe that a female brain means you're more likely to have a disposition and personality marker like empathy rather than the male logic and coldness, surely you'd find individuals from both classes at both ends of this bell curve plotting normal distribution of normal personality traits and attributes. That doesn't mean those individuals do not have their sex body or cannot identify as their sex. Why is a supposed feminine personality trait in a male body sufficient to now name this male a woman? Does it not make sense to say this feminine personality can be male as it rests in a male body? I'm aggressive and quite arrogant, which seem to be masculine traits, yet I am a woman. I am a female. And how deluded and oppressive and offensive to assign traits to sex bodies. I'm sorry I even had to taste that rationalization in my mouth. So. All in all, I hope that what you're getting from this is that this is a faith-based argument, entirely based around this sexed soul idea, rather than anything else. Gender identity- It has literally nothing to do with a soul. This is- It has nothing to do with a soul. This is, like, uh, the- just a way to make it sound like some religion that's cuckoo and out there, but it has literally nothing to do with a soul. It is not, not related whatsoever. It is uh, just regular concepts, just like, you know, any other concept, just normal concepts. That's it. Just they, they, but concepts are all souls, you know. The, she, she hates the chair argument because she believes a chair is a soul, actually. Identity means nothing. It cannot be understood. We cannot empirically test it, prove it, and it remains a subjective state, almost like a religion. As an atheist, I'm not entirely sure how a soul would be sexed. Souls do not have a reproductive marker. They do not have a reproductive strategy. <laughs> we are an evolutionary species and we've evolved to look around and name humans male or female. If I look around and you look like a female, I'll probably call you a female and the same goes for men. And I'm sure if you're a progressive watching this, which I hope you are, you'd probably agree that sex doesn't matter with how we treat each other. But when sex matters, it is sex that matters and not gender. This is literally, yes, this is my argument, yes. Like, gender matters by far the majority of the time. Sometimes, sex matters. And when it matters, it matters. And that's like a, it, you're, you're going to be communicating something different than gender when sex matters. So, 
But by far the majority of the time, you're not engaging with sex in any way. You're engaging with gender. So Judith Butler, who is a postmodernist, post-structuralist philosopher, says that sex is a social construct. I tend to completely disagree. Sex is a material reality, observed at birth, not assigned. And if the birth is of a female child, you instantly know culturally what to do with this child. She is pink, she's frilly, she's to blame if she is raped, she's got to be a mother, we have to push her in feminine directions. Judith Butler wants you to believe that that, that, that social construction, that force, is the real thing. That those cultural practices are the real thing and that sex itself is meaningless. Trans activists want everyone to be forced to go along with this doctrine. Reality is not constructed reality. Words create social reality. But saying words are the only thing that creates social reality is very silly. There is the reality, right? Death, mammals are two sexes. I'm sure that there are more. <laughs> Our words interact with reality. They aren't the only reality. They aren't the reality. To say there is no reality and only the construction of reality is frankly quite stupid. So... There, this is why at the beginning I was saying that there's an issue where you don't actually understand like deconstruction because you're going to have a lot of trouble engaging with the entire argument if you don't understand like deconstruction. So let's say, let's say like there's just the ground. We don't have a word for a rock. We don't have a word for like a mountain. We don't have a word for a tree. Like we don't have a word for this stuff. It's just the ground. If you don't have a word to describe it, it's unlikely you actually understand the differences yourself. It will all be the same to you as well. And if you do understand the differences, you'll have a word to describe it. You'll like, as soon as you're able to categorize something, you're going to have a label for it so that you can communicate it. If you can't communicate it, it likely does not exist to you. It's very hard. Like name something that exists to you that you do not have a word for. You, it doesn't exist because you can't categorize it. You have to be able to categorize something in order for it to exist to you first. And so this is like, this is the important part that's being missed is if we don't have words to describe these things, they just don't exist to us. And when I say us, I mean humans. Like as humans, a thing cannot exist to us until we have some way to communicate it or, or categorize it. So why do you care? And we can make up other things that don't exist as long as we just put a word to it, right? I can, I can talk about Walmart. Walmart doesn't exist. Walmart's not an objective thing. It's not really there. It's There's stores that have Walmart on it, but each one is not the Walmart. Walmart is a much bigger thing. and uh, And now we're able to engage with it tangibly just like we would anything else because we put a label to it. We've categorized it and put a word to it and now it exists. Why do you care, turf? Ugly, stinky, turf? Well, this is the James Berry story. Margaret Ann Bulkley. So Margaret Bulkley was born, if I remember correctly, in 1789 in County Cork. It was around then anyway. And the early part of her life isn't very clear, but she seems to have been supported by an uncle to go to, to train as a doctor. And there was only one place she could do that, and that was the University of Edinburgh. And she, because they, not because they accepted women, they didn't at any of the universities that she could go to, but because they took children, basically. They had no age limit. So even though she was an adult, she presented herself as a precocious boy. And she turned up there, you know, I think at age 18 or 19, saying she was 12 and a boy. And she got her medical degree. And the point was that she was going to go out to Venezuela, where there were no rules against women being doctors. But then Venezuela had a revolution, and that never happened. So she was kind of stuck. She had this medical degree, and she had this um, male... I think there's actually a phenomenon with colors. For example, colors we labeled blue and green, both being labeled blue. Yes, exactly. Yep. Name. Now, she was about four foot ten. <laughs> her voice had never broken. I, I cannot actually believe that that many people around her seriously thought 
that she was a man. But anyway, she lived her entire lifetime as a man, James Barry. She worked in the um, army. She was an army doctor. She went out to India. She met Florence Nightingale, who said she was completely horrible. Like Florence Nightingale said, he was one of the most vicious and nasty little men that she'd ever met. <laughs> Constantly starting duels. <laughs> like, or at least, you know, taking the sword out and saying she was going to. And so this story, um, it, it, it was written up as a biography. Um, a, a woman, a, something like a woman ahead of her time, I think was the title, that came out in 2016. So she was still understood as a woman who had, through ex incredible resourcefulness, found a way through the extreme restrictions on womanhood, which you could understand as gender if you want, although they weren't using that word then. You know, she had, she had broken the bounds of gender and she had shown what her sex was capable of. And then um, there was a fictionalised version of the book due out in about 2021. And as soon as that was announced, when the book was sold, it started to get all these negative reviews. Before it had even been written on Goodreads saying it was transphobic trash and that, you know, James Barry was a man and, you know, it was it dead naming James Barry him by saying her and mentioning the name Margaret Bulkley and so on. So somewhere between 2016 and 2021 is when it happened. And what it is, is switching from understanding this story as, you know, the very long history of oppression of women by something you could call gender. Exceptional women like Florence Nightingale, like Margaret Bulkley and others, showing that those restrictions were unjust and that when you removed those restrictions, women could thrive in all the places that they were not meant to. Two, understanding any woman who did that as a man. So this is why I care. I want to decimate a gender. Yes, it sounds like she was understood as a man. It sounds like she lived her life as a man. That didn't mean that she stopped being a female. But yeah, everybody around her knew her as a man so of course like i feel like her i feel like she proves the point more than anything else you're saying she was female but she was a man yeah no she she was a man a role that involves masochism, self-hatred, and passivity as a prerequisite. I resent I am to be seen as fragile, submissive, pink, and ditzy. I resent that I must be a hole for fucking, a mouth for fucking, an ass for fucking, a nurse, a saint, a mother, an object. That I have to have a predisposition for kindness and gentleness, that my hair has to be long, my leg shaved, that I must be an incubator, that I have to look fuckable at all moments of the day, even when I am ill, even when I am building a person in my body, even when I am old, even when I am dying, that I must stay young and pure and pale. I don't want to be any of these things as a default, and I will not be pushed into these things. And when a man does these things, it does not and should not give him access to my bathrooms, my sports, my prisons, and my crisis centers, and even my body in a medical setting. So let's talk about self-ID. What is self-ID? Self-ID allows trans people to self-determine their gender without the need for a psychiatric diagnosis to confirm. So just to be clear, again, like a lot of the things that she's going to disagree with here, like stuff like self-ID, I still disagree with. I still think all of this stuff is stupid. It doesn't make sense. It's it's all dumb jargon. It's retarded. I don't agree with it. But I'm able to do this while still believing that trans women are women, right? I'm still able to have like a very coherent idea of gender that makes sense without just saying, "Well, no, let's just let's just dumb it all down to sex." Um and I think a lot of this is like to say, like, well, if you buy into some of it, you got to buy into all of it. But I obviously don't. And I think what I believe is, uh, I mean, I, I've already had this argument on gender with other uh, linguistic philosophers who all agree like everything that I my doc professes is coherent and cogent and makes perfect sense that doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with it but um but my point is even my point is is that you can have a different concept of this from like self ideas and and it can still make sense and be cogent and you don't have to be either a self idea or uh, like a sex essentialist. You, there are other things in between that still are coherent and make sense. Firm their status. I think this is a misnomer. It seems very accurate that self ID is the demand for other people to comply with your identification. 
In many countries, a legal gender change is not required to enter single-sex spaces like women's toilets or alter their gender on many official documents such as medical forms. Same in our current political cultural paradigm, trans women may as well be women. Yeah. Where does self-ID already exist? At least 13 countries allow self-ID. According to a December report by Victor Magical Borlos, the United Nations independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. They include Argentina, Ireland, Malta, Belgium, Portugal, New Zealand, Colombia, Denmark, Uruguay, Iceland, Brazil, and Norway. In the U.S., the New Jersey Department of Corrections makes it customary for prisoners who identify as transgender, intersex, or non-binary to be assigned a prison stay in line with their gender identity, not with the sex they were assigned at birth. Research has shown that transgender inmates face particular danger while in prison, but few states offer them protections like these in reality. But it is becoming commonplace, and there is a push for it. Connecticut and California passed laws in 2018 and 2020, respectively, that require transgender inmates to be assigned prisons based on their gender identity. Rhode Island, New York City, and Massachusetts also have housed inmates based on their gender identity. Lambda Legal, the Transgender Law Center, and the American Civil Liberties Union Foundation of Southern California, ACLU, SoCal, filed a motion to intervene in a lawsuit challenging a California law protecting transgender, non-binary, and intersex inmates. So under a 2020 law, the State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is required to house inmates and in correctional facilities designed for men or women based on their reported gender identity. The department must also recognize an inmate's self-reported gender identity and pronouns. This is becoming commonplace. So an estimated 91% of victims of rape and sexual assault are female. 9% are male. Nearly 99% of perpetrators are male. With self-ID laws, anyone can claim that they're a woman. This means anyone. Not even actual transsexuals. Anyone. So, you see where this can potentially pose a problem. This is the Swedish study, which a lot of people talk about, and a lot of turfs talk about, and a lot of people advocating for single-sex safe spaces talk about. So, the Swedish cohort study followed a population of individuals who had undergone surgical and legal sex reassignment involving hormonal and surgery treatment between 1973 and 2003, 324 in total, and compared them to a matched control group of their birth sex. It is crucial to emphasize that this study looks only at those who have undergone hormonal and surgical transition, which is a much tighter group than individuals who self-identify as transgender. The primary purpose of the study was to consider whether medical transition helps patients, leads to better social and health outcomes, and to inform what support they might need post-transition. It is methodologically methodological. Uh, yeah, this is the one that we went over the other day. This is the one that's, yeah, this is the Swedish study. This is not, this does not align with anybody else who's done the same study. It, it is an outlier. It is different from everybody else's. Uh, trans people are between everybody else according to like literally every other study we we just went over this on stream the other day so like a trans woman will commit more crime than a cis woman but less crime than a cis man and a uh, a trans man will commit more crime than a trans woman or sorry than a cis woman and less than a cis man across the board they commit more violent crime than females yeah that's what i'm saying they commit more crime than cis women but less than much less than a cis man and health outcomes and to inform what support they might need post-transition. It is methodologically methodolog it is methodolog <laughs> it is methodol methodologically Christ almighty robust, peer-reviewed large-scale comparative source on offending rights comparing trans women and women. It compared the likelihood of a person having one or more criminal convictions and convictions for violent crime defined as homicide and attempted homicide, aggravated assault and assault, robbery, threatening behavior, harassment arson or any sexual offense. The study can be divided into two cohorts, 1970 to 1988 and 1989 to 2003, with the difference being that the latter cohort received adequate mental health provision. The findings show that transsexual individuals were more likely to be criminal than non-transsexuals of the same birth sex in the first cohort, and no different from their birth sex in the second group. So the researchers state male to females, trans women, retained a male pattern regarding criminality. The same was true regarding violent crime. 
Male to female transitioners were over six times more likely to be convicted of an offense than female comparators, and 18 times more likely to be convicted of a violent offense. The group had no statistically significant differences from other natal males for convictions in general or for violent offending. The group examined were those who committed to surgery, and so were more tightly defined than the population based solely on self-declarations, solely self-ID. So, we know that males are the stronger sex, and that females are the smaller, weaker sex. And because of that, as an act of equity, we protect females from male violence, as male violence is pervasive. And so this is a hard one. And perhaps we can have a Q&A after this video at some point, or even a panel or discussion on what to do and where to house trans prisoners. Because although I do see and understand and empathize with the danger that trans women face in general pop male prisons, I struggle to find how that is women's problem and how women should be used as collateral in that. I struggle to understand why in one of the only places, and some of the only places where women are isolated from male violence, being a prison or a crisis shelter, why we would introduce that if someone just feels like a woman because they like to paint their nails, or because they feel more submissive, or because they feel like they have more empathy than the normal male population. I struggle with it. So. Yeah, I, like, when, wow, when you keep straw manning things, that hardcore when you're like when they feel like they have more empathy than the general population absolutely nobody saying anything like that like that that is just too much of a straw man unfortunately uh we're gonna have to get down to a big component of the conversation that a lot of people don't want to talk about and as someone who tries to be sensitive to people who have traits they can't control, I will try to be careful with my words because there are very limited explanations for transsexualism. I have to bring up the elephant in the room. We have to talk about autogynephilia. Uh, I thought we were going to talk about your mom. <laughs> the elephant in the room, get it? Saying she's fat. Um, I have very, very vivid um, memories uh, of a time where I would... Um, I would actually arouse myself um, at the thought of being a woman. All the way around, yes. Oh my God. Okay, now turn around. Further back. <laughs> so autogynephilia is defined as a male's propensity to be sexually aroused by the thought of himself as a female. It is the paraphilia that is theorized to underlie transvestism and some forms of male to female transsexualism. Beginning in the 1950s, clinicians and researchers developed a variety of classifications of transsexualism. These were variously based on sexual orientation, age of onset, and fetishism. Prior to Blanchard, these classifications generally divided transgender women into two groups. Homosexual transsexuals, if attracted to men, and heterosexual fetishistic transvestites, if sexually attracted to women. These labels carried a social stigma of mere sexual fetishism and contradicted trans women's self-identification as heterosexual or homosexual, respectively. So in 1982, Kurt Freund and colleagues argued that there were two distinct types of male-female transsexuals, like I said earlier, each with distinct causes. One type associated with childhood femininity and androphilia, sexual attraction to men, and another associated with fetishism and gynephilia, which is sexual attraction to women. Freund stated that the sexual arousal in this latter type could be associated not only with cross-dressing, but also with other feminine typical behaviors, such as applying makeup or shaving the legs. Blanchard credited Freund with being the first author to distinguish between erotic arousal due to dressing as a woman, transvestic fetishism, and erotic arousal due to fantasizing about being female, which Freund called cross-gender fetishism. So, Ray Milton Blanchard is an American-Canadian sexologist, best known for his research studies on pedophilia, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Blanchard's transsexualism typology is a proposed psychological typology of gender dysphoria, transsexualism, and fetishistic transvestism created by himself. Building on the work of earlier researchers, including his colleague Kurt Freund, Blanchard categorized trans women into two groups, homosexual transsexuals who are attracted exclusively to men and are feminine in both behavior and appearance, and autogynephilic transsexuals who experience sexual arousal at the idea of having a female body. Blanchard conducted a series of studies on people with gender dysphoria. Analyzing the files of cases seen in the Gender Identity Clinic of the Clark Institute of Psychiatry and comparing them on multiple characteristics. These studies have been criticized. They have mostly been criticized for lacking reproducibility and for a lack of a control group using cisgender women. 
meaning there are people pushing to study whether or not women are attracted to themselves as female. So, Blanchard studies patients who had felt like a woman at all times for at least a year and classifies them according to whether they were attracted to men, women, both, or neither. He then compared these four groups regarding how many in each group reported a history of sexual arousal together with cross-dressing. 73% of gynephilic, asexual, and bisexual groups said that they did experience such feelings, but only 15% of the androphilic group did. He concluded that asexual, bisexual, and gynephilic transsexuals were motivated by erotic arousal to the thought or image of themselves as a woman, and he coined the term autogynephilia to describe this. Blanchard and his colleagues conducted a study in 1986 using phallometry, a measure of blood flow to the penis, demonstrating arousal in response to cross-dressing audio narratives among trans women. Although this study is often cited as evidence for autogynephilia, the authors did not attempt to measure subjects' ideas of themselves as a woman. So, there's that. The authors concluded that gynephilic gender identity patients who denied experiencing arousal to cross-dressing were still measurably aroused by autogynephilic stimuli, and that autogynephilia among non-androphilic trans women was negatively associated with tendency to color their narrative to be more socially acceptable. However, in addition to having methodological problems, the reported data did not support this conclusion because the measured arousal to cross-dressing situations was minimal and consistent with subject self-reported arousal. <laughs> Sounds like you read that from a Wikipedia lab! Wikipedia! This study has been cited by proponents of the theory to argue that gynephilic trans women who reported no gynephilic interests were misrepresenting their erotic interests. <laughs> Apparently it's transphobic to bring any of this up. So, unfortunately, there is no world in which I feel comfortable with people fetishizing themselves as women entering my safe spaces or access to opportunities reserved for females. Gender identity disturbances in males is always accompanied by one or two erotic anomalies. Quote, all gender dysphoric males who are not sexually oriented... Yeah, just... Autogynephilia probably exists, but there's not like a whole lot of evidence that it is uh, a lot of trans people, especially not most trans people. So when she says it's the elephant in the room, she means like nobody cares or talks about it. And it's uh, pretty much a non-existent theory that only TERFs talk about so that's the elephant oriented towards men are instead sexually oriented toward the thought or image of themselves as a woman the latter erotic or amatory propensity is of course the phenomenon labeled by hirschfield as auto monosexualism because of the inconsistent history of this term however and its non-descriptive derivation the writer would prefer to replace it with the term autogynephilia it should be noted that the concept of autogynephilia does not imply that autogynephilic males are always sexually aroused by the thought of themselves as a woman, or by dressing in women's clothes, or by contemplating themselves cross-dressing in the mirror, any more than a man in love always obtains an erection at the sight of his sweetheart, or pair-bonded geese copulate continuously. Like, I don't, I don't understand why would you transition and, like, get surgeries and get like extremely ridiculed and all of these other things instead of just dressing up as a woman sometimes. Like uh, to people with autogatophilia, are they horny all the time? Because it's an obsessive paraphilia. Yeah. It, I don't know. It doesn't, uh, you should get surgery in my opinion. Oh, you shouldn't get surgery in my opinion. Oh, I thought you were re recommending I get surgery. I think I'd make a pretty hot chick. It doesn't mean that all these people are creepy and looking to, you know, harass or, um, victimize women. Blanchard describes autogynephilia as both a paraphilia and a sexual orientation, where the autogynephilic male is oriented inwards to a fantasy female self. This fantasy can be of several types, such as an anatomic autogynephilia, fetishizing female physiology, behavioral autogynephilia, fetishizing feminine behavior, and transvestic autogynephilia, fetishizing female clothing. Most autogynephiles are more than one type. He also notes in his papers that this is a paraphilia that has been recorded since at least the 19th century. Blanchard also comments on a phenomena that has become apparent on websites like Tumblr, of teenage girls reading erotic literature about gay men termed yaoi, literature which is aimed at women, not gay men, and then identifying as gay trans men, mentioning a case history that was rather similar. Possibly one of the best resources on autogynephilia is Anne A. Lawrence's Men Trapped in Men's Bodies. 
Lawrence, who admits her autogynephilia and transition to the mid-90s, describes multiple case histories and the science behind autogynephilia in detail. Lawrence agrees with the Blanchard typology. Quote, I would simply like to state for the record that based on my clinical experience and my reading of the scientific literature, I'm firmly convinced that the overwhelming majority, probably 98% or more of cases of severe gender dysphoria in men, arise in connection with either effeminate homosexuality or autogynephilia. Most of the rare exceptions probably arise in connection with conditions such as schizophrenia and certain personality disorders. The idea that substantial numbers of male-to-female transsexuals belong to a putative third type that is neither homosexual nor autogynephilic is inconsistent with my clinical experience and, in my opinion, inconsistent with the best available empirical evidence. Lawrence also describes that autogynephiles in clinical studies frequently lie about the sexual arousal they associate with cross-dressing and their sexual fantasies of being a woman, and many lie about being homosexual in order to obtain sexual reassignment services. Autogynephilia sounds completely unchoosable. It sounds like a sexuality that is innate, that you cannot help, that consumes your life. I have empathy for the people who have this, and to some degree, I don't really care about it. I don't care about what you're into, or what your sexuality is to befriend you, hang out with you, or treat you with respect. I do, however, think some discrimination for paraphilias or sexualities are in order. In the same way, I would not want to allow a pedophile to work in an elementary school. I just refuse to believe someone can become a legally protected woman who isn't female through just the prerequisite of having a paraphilia. This seems to be the only empirical data behind or explaining gender identity, and even if there's a 10% chance it holds up, it's enough for me and other women to set a boundary. I want women as a sex class to remain protected without fear of male violence. Now, while you've listened to this, I hope I have not given off the impression of hatred. I think that there are there are a lot of things that can be said about this issue, um, the issue of genderism, but I think ultimately what this issue does is destructive. I think that gender identity ideology is destructive. I think it's regressive. I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong to say that a woman should or has to behave in a certain way or else they are not a woman, or that you can opt in and out of that. You can opt in and out of your sex-based depression. You can opt out of your female body. I remember I got canceled, uh, you know, two years ago, I think, on TikTok because I had said that the term birthing bodies was ridiculous. Because after Roe v. Wade was overturned. So Somehow this video is almost over and it hasn't even like touched on the most important aspects of gender that you would assume anybody talking about it would actually get into. Instead, it's like just a way to paint it all as like, look how bad it is. Look at these. Look at uh, autogynephilix. Look at the prison system. Look at this. Look at that. Like. This can all still be real and exist and be exactly the way that I'm explaining it. And all of this would literally change none of it. Like it wouldn't change anything. There's nothing in here that anybody who actually talks about this subject would actually like, uh, would be able to engage with because these are, you're just saying like, Hey, it's bad to engage with reality. So don't do it. This is, this is pretty much what this is saying. Hey, look, look how bad reality is. Don't let's, let's just, let's just close our eyes and go la, 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 and then we'll all be better. <laughs> so many people were like, remember non-binary people and men experience abortion as well. And I was so angry. That made me so angry. Because I, I thought to myself, in a world where it is so clear that there is a war on the female body to legislate controlling it, thinking that you can opt out of that is pure narcissism and ego. And it's a pain response. It's a trauma response. And this feels very personal to me because when I was a gender non-conforming queer person, butchier in my teenage years, when I was dating women and living that lifestyle, I, I, I thought, I started wearing a binder and I had an eating disorder and I, I was trying to starve the woman out of me. I was so scared of becoming a woman because of what it meant. And now we see so many detransitioners who are female coming forward. So many, so, so many. And they're met with abuse for, for coming out about how harmful this idea is. But when you get down to the brass tacks, when you think about it, what woman, what girl thinks about the world thinks about the future she has set up for her. A future of female sexual subordination and subjugation, enslavement through narcissism and the way that you look and how fuckable you are and how much work goes into that 
if you are to exist as a woman in this society, what woman looks to that and goes, hell yeah, I'm so gagged. I'm so excited to be put in this cage my whole life. Certainly. I, I yeah, I agree. It's almost as though you would have to have like a serious mental disorder in order to uh, to put yourself through that. It's almost as though like you would have to have like a serious condition that would uh would kind of force you into that position. How do you measure it? The same way you measure literally all mental illnesses. The same exact way, actually. It's crazy. The detransitioners think they have it. What? The detransitioners do have it. They develop it. If you transition without actually having gender dysphoria, yeah, you're going to develop gender dysphoria. The detransitioners were so sure. Yeah, well, it's a very minute, small amount of people. So thankfully, we have a very good process to making sure that you're uh, actually, that you actually have gender dysphoria before you transition and get a, uh, like a, an irreversible amount of gender affirming care to where like 68% of uh, people who are starting any sort of uh, questioning end up desisting, which really means they just don't have gender dysphoria. They never had it and they're finding out that they don't have it. And then once they actually transition, damn, the process is so good. There's a 1% regret rate. So yeah, we like uh, the 1% of uh, detransitioners definitely developed gender dysphoria, which is why they go on about how bad transitioning is, is because for them personally, because they didn't have gender dysphoria, then they transitioned, they developed gender dysphoria because you can't live as a gender that you do not identify with. You can't live at that live as that gender, which is how we know that gender identity actually is fixed. Why that there is a fact of the matter when it comes to gender is that there that anybody would develop gender dysphoria if they are not seen and uh, and they don't exist as the gender that they identify with and not their personal like stated identity, but the like the fact of the matter to their identity only every young girl who thinks they have the option of not doing that would take it i wanted to take it i wished i could have been born a man when i was younger because of the way i knew society treated women then why don't you transition why don't you transition because <laughs> you can't you would Develop gender dysphoria. There is something within you that is very much a woman, that is very much feminine, that forces you to, to hold on to your femininity. I didn't like pink. I wanted to play in the mud. I wanted to go fishing with my dad. I thought those things maybe made me a boy based on some arbitrary social rules. What is it? A soul? No. What is, what, what is, uh, um, crap. I'm blanking on the, I, I, I can't think of the, the word. What is it that makes us like, it's what humans have that we're, what we're like more aware than other animals that we have, like we, uh, consciousness. Yes. Like what is consciousness? What is that? 
Is it real? No, nah, the consciousness doesn't exist because we can't pinpoint it in the brain. This is where your consciousness exists. So, so it's a soul. Consciousness is a soul, guys. That's all. It's just a soul. That's all consciousness is. Maybe I'd go as far as to mutilate my body if I, if there hadn't been intervention. So, when you think about it, all of this just seems very dystopian. And I understand we're in a culture in which everything is distraction, trying to distract us from the pain of reality. But we can pinpoint interests and in even sexuality uh, somewhat that we can pinpoint not we can't tell somebody about their sexuality uh, just by looking at it in their brain outside of like, uh, what do you call it? I'm blanking on the. You're brain dead? Damn it. I am brain dead. Yeah, I'm brain dead. I think women should set their boundaries and I think they should ask for more. They should advocate for better living conditions as women. And I will die doing that. So. This whole gender thing. The gender thing. You don't know what it is. Pretty incoherent. If I believed the things that you were saying, I would believe it was incoherent as well. Where I hope every transsexual or autogynophilic or trans person self-identified or diagnosed, I hope they find self-acceptance in their material bodies. I hope they find it. Because how painful would it be to feel like your body doesn't belong to you or that it's not supposed to be there. I understand the painfulness of that disease, but it's just not true. You are your body. You are your body. It doesn't matter what it does. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You are your body. When an anorexic goes to the doctor, the doctor's not, oh, we should give you lipo. You should be thinner. If you feel thin, if you feel like you should be thinner, we will give you lipo. And now the left is advocating to give medication to young people, to children, to stop their puberty and to potentially mutilate themselves with plastic surgery. It's dystopian. And it's scary. And there should be outcry on the left for this, not just the fucking losers on the right. The homophobic, bigoted losers. There should be a movement on the left to oppose this dangerous ideology. This dangerous. We need homophobic, bigoted losers on the left, guys. Let's go. Dangerous, oppressive, regressive ideology. And with that, I hope I've given you something to think about. Just something to chew on. Just something light to chew on. A snack. Anyway, I love you all. Every person watching this, I love you. And I hope we all find peace. And I hope we all find solutions or trade-offs. See you next time. Well, she said she wants peace. So I think it's a great video. I agree with all of this. I got to make some food real quick. So uh, I am starving like Marvin, girl. Baby, I'll go more than bang, ding, 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 